Well, thank you for uh, coming here tonight. My father is a Mohawk from Six Nations, just down the road. During the War of 1812, my father's relatives fought against my mother's relatives. She's a Tuscarora from New York. A lot of times we forget in this uh, war between uh, Great Britain and the United States that the native people were literally caught in the middle. And we're I, uh, from Six Nations. We call ourselves the Haudenosaunee. Uh, that means people of the longhouse. People are building this longhouse. And it was primarily Haudenosaunee on both sides of the river, along with the Anishinaabek people also on both sides uh, in the states and Ontario that uh, played a big part in this uh, war. I'd have to say though, uh, history has uh, been kind of, it's been kind of a mixed blessing. We've gotten certain attention in the past uh, for uh, our involvement in the, in the war, and certainly recently in the last uh, 18 months, a lot more attention. So it's by default that I'm here, and I'm just the only guy in the community who was working on this, and so they say, Rick, you go talk, and that's usually the way things get started. We refer to war as a big, to, uh, a big tornado, a big whirlwind that comes among the people, and it picks everything up, throws it upside down. Everything that you're used to gets twisted over it. And so the dark clouds on the horizon, the war clouds that are gathering together, the drum beats, the cannon fire, all signal this, this uh, war coming to us. So our people were very aware of that. And so I just want to give you a little bit of history here. We didn't have a whole lot of uh, relationships with Tecumseh and, uh, and the Shawnees, uh, in particular in this war, but it's important to remember that there really was a war boiling before this war. And I dare say if the War of 1812 hadn't broke out, there would have been a war with the native people in the Ohio Valley, uh, both with, or either with uh, Great Britain or the United States. Tecumseh had a vision, though, that is a very powerful one. Basically, his vision is, I've had enough of this stuff. He draws a line in the ground and says, in order for us to maintain our nationhood, we have to push all the white people back. In fact, he advocated burning down the house of everybody and pushing them back and keeping them back and then restoring the kind of practices that he saw were at risk. You've got to understand, in up to 1812, there was great unrest in the Ohio Valley. And his brother, which is actually his name uh, translates to, uh, he opens the door, he had a vision. It was actually his vision that helped uh, drive uh, Tecumseh's vision. And, and as you can see in this one, but he says, if you want to save yourself, you have to have a personal revolution in your way of life. He's talking to his own people because he's saying, if you don't like what's going on right now, then quit drinking alcohol, uh, quit selling land, uh, quit wearing a uh, white man's clothes, quit doing those things that take you away from our spiritual origin, get back on track. So this was, in that sense, kind of a religious war going on. It was a, it was a war over the kind of life that we want to live. But because we suffered a common experience in Western expansion of both Great Britain and the United States, our people were thrown together out of necessity to decide that. Uh, this is a quilled uh, bag. It's a piece of leather decorated with porcupine quills. And I, we don't know for sure where it came from, but it just symbolizes to me what was going on. Two of our great allies, Great Britain and the United States, father and son, cousins, were not ready to duke it out again. During the Revolutionary War, my father's relatives fought against my mother's relatives. That's why we ended up at Grand River. But this piece kind of shows that uh, uh, moment. Who would you pick? They both look fairly equal. They're both fighting for what they believe is right. Our people were caught right in the middle. So we had divided loyalties because for many years we had a treaty relationship with Great Britain. And in fact, uh, that treaty relationship goes back to 1677. Before there was a Canada, before the United States, we were allies to the Crown. So half of our people felt that was very strong. The other half felt a kinship with the new Americans who won their freedom from that Crown. And in the old days, the war club that we see on one side uh, and the tomahawk were the two primary weapons that our relatives used. And this painting from about 1820 is probably the closest we have as to what did the warriors actually look like. Some of them were still in more traditional dress. Some of them were more in westernized clothing. I talked about this uh, relationship to the king, and it's symbolized in the wampum belt that we see here. It's called the covenant chain. And I brought a, um, a, an example of that. This is a replica of the belt. This represents the king. There's this pathway that connects all the way from uh, London across the Atlantic Ocean to our nations over here. And whenever the king wanted our attention, he would shake that chain. It would rever reverberate all the way to our council, and we'd say, okay, now what does he want? Well, he usually wanted us to fight or wanted some more land. 
when we needed the king's attention, we would shake that chain, and we'd shake the chain, we'd shake the chain, and we got, usually got a busy signal. But <clears throat> this alliance allowed us to coexist for many years. I'm going to actually pass this around while I'm talking to take a look at it. Now, these are made out of glass beads. The originals are made out of uh, shell beads, as we see here. And this particular belt was actually made by the British and given to us. So wampum becomes our mutual uh, diplomatic language. I'm sure many of you heard of Joseph Brandt. He was uh, quite, a, uh, quite a man, uh, quite uh, devout in his, uh, his uh, alliance with the crown. Well, John Brandt, his son, grew up within this uh, persona. And in fact, he allied himself so much with the British, even his mother got a little worried about him. She says, John, there isn't much left you that's Mohawk except for your moccasins. So uh, fortunately, though, John was, uh, uh, I mean, Joseph Brandt passed away just prior to the war, and his son kind of picked up that mantle of a relationship to the crown. And among the Mohawks, that was a very, uh, very sincere, very important thing. But I also mentioned then our relationship to the United States. And like all things American, their philosophy was the bigger the better. So they made, could you give me a hand with this one here? They made one of the biggest wampum belts ever made. And this was given to us in uh, 1790. We can see the longhouse, can you see it in the middle? And the 13 original states all standing there, just like our covenant with the king. So these uh, wampum belts represent our treaty relationship. Uh, they're considered to be sacred covenants. And so you can imagine, you're back there in 1812, the, the uh, whirlwind is coming, and the question is, who are you going to go with? And we'll take a look at the dialogue that happened among our people then. Uh, you may have heard of Red Jacket. He was a Seneca leader from Buffalo Creek, where Buffalo, New York is today. That used to be a big reservation. And Buffalo Creek held all of the Six Nations there. They moved there after the Americans uh, burned us out during the American Revolutionary War. But Red Jacket, ironically, who was uh, staunchly opposed to giving up land, much like Tecumseh and his brother, was advocating we should return back to our traditions. But he said, you know, if we learn one thing, we can't trust the British or the Americans. Because in the end, they're after our land. And our land's getting smaller. So how about this? Let's stand aside from this fight. And for the Senecas and the Seneca leaders, that was kind of big news. If you go to the city of Buffalo and you look up at the city hall, you'll see this carving up there on the wall. And it shows a red jacket presenting this tomahawk to the US Indian agent, 1810. The tomahawk becomes the symbol of the request from the government, whether it's the Crown or the United States, to the native people, I'm handing you this tomahawk to please go uh, fight our enemies. It's not just a ceremonial thing, it's very important because we're supposed to be people of peace, but when the king or the president calls, it's hard to ignore. We had this other man, 1799, his name was Handsome Lake. He had a vision, just like uh, Tecumseh's brother, the, the prophet. But Handsome Lake's vision was kind of similar. We got to get back to our ceremonies, get rid of alcohol, and, and uh, take care of ourselves. But in particular, he said, but we shouldn't fight in the white man's war because of what we learned in the Revolutionary War and the French and Indian Wars uh, during the, the Dutch and uh, English Wars. And he was very adamant, unless we stand aside from this war, we're going to lose it all. So you had a very confused uh, crowd among the Haudenosaunee. So whenever the king, like I said, wanted our attention, he would usually send one of his Indian agents, and as you see the guy here all decked out in native finery, holding a big long wampum belt that's purple belt with a white tomahawk. That's the king's request. Here, would you come and fight on my behalf? Now a purple belt meant war or death or the dark times, just like the dark cloud. The white belt would generally symbolize peace. So they would offer this belt to us. If we took the belt, it would mean we'd, we would fight. And at the end of the war, we would give the tomahawk back and the belt back. So wampum belts were circulated all over between our peoples. And sometimes you'd be there, at one council you get a belt from the British, the next council you get a belt from the Americans. So there's a constant reminder of what side are we going to choose. And the tomahawks were also delivered. The idea is they would give us the wampum belt and if we agreed to fight, that meant they were going to supply us with everything necessary to make that fight. All of the weapons, all, all of the clothing, all of the food, all the ammunition, and not only for the men fighting, but for our families back home. So it was a big commitment on, top, on behalf of the British or the Americans. So on the left, we see the tomahawk that was given to uh, Tecumseh. 
On the right, we see the tomahawk that was given to Joseph Brandt. These are very uh, important symbols. Now, if you notice the tomahawk, it's actually two things. There's a pipe bowl on one side. You can smoke the peace pipe and make peace. And then there's a sharp blade on the other side. In case that doesn't work out, uh, <laughs> you can do a little uh, reassessment. Prior to the war, when we saw these dark clouds building, Red Jacket sent this wampum belt over to their chiefs at Six Nations with a very kind of desperate plea. Please, please, let's remain neutral in this fight coming up. If we learn anything from the last time, we have to be careful. Uh, we're putting our women and children at risk, so let's, let's set this aside. Unfortunately, the sting of the loss from the Revolutionary War and a few very vocal uh, adherents to the crown uh, put Red Jacket off and said, no, we have an alliance to maintain with the crown, so we're going to fight. And it was this original pledge of the crown that was made to our people that was the source of that alliance. But now another character comes into the story, this guy here. His name is uh, John Norton. He's probably one of the most uh, influential Haudenosaunee characters who does not have a drop of Haudenosaunee blood because he's half Scottish and half Cherokee, but got adopted by Joseph Brent. And so therefore he learned to speak Mohawk. They actually said they made him, a, uh, gave him a position. He went over to England to try to meet King George and we see him the peace medal that be, John Norton was the kind of character any one of you could have become us because being Haudenosaunee is a national identity, not just a racial thing, and he represented our interests. But maybe because of that, he didn't have the same legacy of unity to our people, the same tradition of peace building. He was the most vocal advocate. We have to fight this war on behalf of the king. In opposition of what the chiefs and our clan mothers, who are our political leaders, uh, wanted. But Red Jacket and the Seneca is not to be dissuaded to send another wampum belt over and another request. This is all prior to the war. Please, let's not do this. Let's stop this fight before it begins. But by then, the, uh, the war hawks among the Haudenosaunee at Grand River said, no, we're going to fight. And if uh, you get in the way, our relatives across the river, uh, you'll be sorry for that. So the old tradition of peace that we had failed. So it's true we have a war dance, and those war dances were then uh, started from about at, uh, back home in Ashwigan, uh, down at uh, Fort George, uh, rallying the guys, getting them ready to fight. Think of it this way, uh, if we're the community at Six Nations, it wasn't the chief said, uh, we're going to declare war and all you young men are, have to join in. They left it up to everybody. You follow your heart, you follow your heart. But if he decides he's going to fight, then he would rally people around him. That's like the old mechanism. Back then we had the Indian Department, which was like a quasi-government military uh, agency that would interacted with the native people. And so the Indian Department then would either point him a, a captain or a colonel, maybe you as a captain or colonel, get you some warriors to work with you, but they would pay everybody. In many ways, our warriors were more like mercenaries because they would only fight if they got paid and got equipped and would fight under this uh, kind of quasi-military command. Well, I'm sure you're all familiar then what took place in October 1812 when uh, Brock uh, tried to retake the uh, uh, Queenston Heights and was uh, killed. Uh, and the story, although it's, it's acknowledged, but a lot of people don't realize, think about this. By the time the war or that fight started, there were about a thousand Americans on the bridge. If you've been to Queenston Heights, it's uh, right by the, the gorge. And uh, there were about 80 warriors under the command of John Norton and John Brandt. Those 80 warriors were able to hold off and destabilize those 1,000 American troops long enough for the British reinforcements to come in. It's still amazing to me today to try to think of what that's like. I mean, that's about, uh, we'd probably we'd be lucky if we have 80 people in a room here today. Us against 1,000 soldiers. What did it take for them to be able to do that? Well, we'll, we'll look into that. Because what happened at Queenston Heights then is where we felt our first major victory, and part of it was because the Americans were so afraid of warriors, and you gotta understand this is a whole long-standing thing that goes back to American history. Their fear of warriors actually drove some of their soldiers, the minute they heard the war cry, saw that tomahawk flying through the air, saw the guns going off, they turned and ran and literally jumped into the gorge as we see in this kind of uh, fanciful picture. Uh, and uh, some of them tried to jump in the rapids and swim back 
They, they got so scared, their reinforcements refused to cross the river to help them. And in the end of the day, uh, several hundred of them surrendered. Many were killed that day. And in fact, the other fanciful picture shows John Brandt trying to even, uh, you know, do in the last officers who were surrendering. That our warriors, the whole 80 of them, they eventually there was about 150 towards the end of the battle, um, felt so victorious and felt, finally, we can beat these Americans. You can imagine how big a psychological advantage that was, not only for the natives, but for the Canadians and the British. Well, uh, we know Brock got killed, and uh, apparently, if you die in battle, you get to look younger, uh, stronger, and more, uh, more like a Greek god. So <laughs> this was the uh, a monument erected to Brock over in uh, London shortly after his uh, death. Next to him, we can see this uh, Mohawk warrior uh, uh, with probably the world's largest uh, tomahawk standing guard, but almost sounded like saying, well, now what are we going to do? Because the great leader is uh, gone. But uh, they were able to rally both sides. But how we remember history is maybe sometimes even more important what the actual history was in the minds of most people. So uh, a person falling in battle, a leader falling in battle deserves recognition, but this is a little extreme. Our people also recognized Brock. In fact, they held what we call a condolence ceremony for him. In 1915, a group of chiefs from Grand River went down to Queenston Heights and they carried this shield. I know it's very hard to see, but there's an inscription on it. And it says on there, Six Nations, 1812, he rests in peace, that Brock rests in peace. And that's just one way they spelled Rodinoshone, Hodinoshone uh, back then. And they placed this uh, shield at his, uh, where the Brock Monument is. And guess what? It was down there for 100 years. Now, most people back in the reserve didn't know it. And as a result of our uh, research, we found it in a little museum in Niagara-on-the-Lake. We got it uh, treated by a conservator, which probably cost more than the whole war did. Uh, and uh, it was on display uh, at uh, the Woodland Center, and now is on display down at the Historical Museum in Niagara-on-the-Lake. You can get down there to see that. But it raised the question in my mind, why did our people feel uh, that compelled to do this honoring of Brock. Well, if you read what he wrote about our people, he wasn't a fan of natives. In fact, he didn't really trust us, but he said it was an absolute necessity. He couldn't win the war without native warriors. He'd rather have them on his side than facing them in the battlefield. Now, you realize we're going through the war very quickly. I just want to talk about a few events of significance. At Stony Creek then in uh, June, they're going to have the anniversary in a, a couple months. Uh, it was a nighttime uh, battle. There were a few warriors there, but I'll tell you a secret story. Uh, and please don't tell anybody. Uh, the British came to our reserve. By then, uh, some of our guys would feel a little hesitant because the Americans are on the move and it looks like they might be victorious. The British came and all they found was old men and young men. And they said, we need your help. Could you come down? This fight we're going to take place. Of course, the old men said, yeah, yeah, we'll be right there. Don't worry. And the British kind of walked away and snickered and says, well, what can these guys really do? But the old man said, well, you wait for our signal. When you hear this shout, then uh, we're going to attack. Anyway, as the battle goes on, of course, they attacked during the middle of the night, and it turns out the warriors did come down from the mountain. But the secret is, is that wasn't that, uh, although we were very expert at fighting, and a small group could do a lot, we had what we called war medicine. This is the power, the spiritual power that you bring to the battle that helps you. Apparently, they employed it that night. It drove the Americans crazy. Every time they saw a figure, they'd shoot, they'd shot all their ammunition, the smoke going on. In fact, it got so bad, one American general actually stumbled into a, a group of uh, British soldiers, and he tried to command them. He said, well, let's go, boys. Well, before he realized that wasn't his voice. So this war medicine confuses you, scares you. That's what happened at Queenston Heights. That's what happened here. And we believe that's what happened in Caledonia. That's another story. In June 1813 at Beaver Dams, this was the great uh, victory that took place primarily at the hands of, of our warriors. We were joined with warriors from up near Montreal, Mohawks from Ganawage, Ganasatage, Akwesasne, Tyendinaga. They sent about 350 warriors down to join with the warriors from Grand River, which were only about 300. And uh, this time the Americans are advancing. We caught them in an ambush and again uh, with, uh, led to their defeat that day. Fear of the warriors also contributed to that defeat as well. The officers got so afraid, and the British were slick enough to use that fear by basically saying, you better surrender to us now, because if you don't, I can't, hold, I can't be responsible for these warriors. And let's just say 
our people understood that, the psychological fear of the tomahawk, of being scalped, of being killed, of being captured. And so the psychological battle of using native warriors, both the Americans and the British, were a very important part of the victories. And then uh, one of the saddest days for the native people came to the war when Tecumseh got uh, killed uh, in uh, October. I know it's hard to see, but you see that little uh, picture up on the right hand corner? Today, if you go to the Naval Academy in Bethesda, Maryland, this is where they train naval officers, there's a statue in the center court. And whenever the cadets walk by, they give him a left-handed salute, they throw pennies at him, and they call upon the spirit of Tecumseh to help them to uh, lead themselves to victory. So whenever the U.S. goes off to war, they have a ceremony for him. Whenever they have graduation, a ceremony. Whenever Army plays Navy in football, they have a ceremony there. So it's kind of twisted psychology to take the person you feared the most in the War of 1812 and that you killed and then turn him into this spiritual icon to help lead your, your uh, servicemen into, uh, into battle today. But that's, that's America. <laughs> when we were doing research for the exhibit at our Brantford, we came across this flag that was down at the National Museum of the American Indian where I used to work in Washington. And they said it was carried by Tecumseh on the battlefield. Well, there are probably three, at least three flags associated with them. And even though this is a, a naval flag, from what I understand, it, it's the British, when they were trying to conjole us, to join them, they would give us uh, uh, weapons, flags, money, all kinds of things. So it's conceivable that he had several flags. See that little wampum belt uh, detail? There's this huge wampum belt that shows Tecumseh standing there with a British officer holding that flag. It didn't mean we were subject to the crown, it just meant that we were allied uh, with them, that we would help them defend that flag. So whether it's actually associated with Tecumseh, uh, there, as many things are after the fact, it's an important symbol of our relationship. But again, in 1813, my, my relatives from Tuscarora came across and talked to the Mohawks down at, there used to be a council house near Fort George, and they said, things are heating up. We're right across the river near Lewiston, New York, we're asking you, if you guys cross the river, you're not going to harm us, are you? But by then, the, uh, the Mohawks in particular were very incensed at how the war was going. They were very incensed at what took place, uh, the burning of Newark, and they did cross the river in uh, December of 1813, and they ended up burning down every home at Tuscarora. So when I was a kid, I began to notice there's some tension between my mother's relatives and my dad's relatives uh, living over here. They kind of kept that sparring going on my parents uh, did, uh, did that most of their life, but apparently they made up because they made five children. One of the aftermaths of this is kind of ironic that uh, Tecumseh gets killed, his brother kind of lost his stature because his vision didn't become true. After his brother got killed, he tried to resurrect his, um, his role in the war, and he made an alliance with John Norton. And I didn't realize this until recently, then they came to Six Nations, that the prophet stayed there for a while and they kind of took care of him and then they asked him to fight. So he goes down to the Battle of Chippewa, 1814, but he arrived a day late. And unfortunately, that was the most significant day in the war for us, because what happened was at the Battle of Chippewa, about 600 Seneca warriors were there and defeated the warriors from Grand River. It was one of the few times uh, my relatives on my father's side uh, felt the sting of death. And about 85 guys were killed that day, about as many as we have in the room, just say, now that's not a lot in the whole picture of the war, but if you only have 350 warriors, 85 dying on one day, that's big stuff. And in our tradition, because we're clan families, if uh, one of our relatives died, all of our clan would be suffering. Basically, it takes us out of commission. So every, every family, there's only about 1,200 people at Six Nations altogether, everybody was hurt. Red Jacket then, I think, oh, excuse me, uh, Red Jacket then made an appeal to uh, put an end to the war. I think I have it here, let me finish on here. Uh, after the fighting stop, or excuse me, after Chippewa, our people withdrew from the war on both sides. A few of them still fought, but most of them stopped fighting. And then when the treaty came about, there's a very important article in the Treaty of Ghent, and it applies directly to you and to, uh, I think, our future discussions. It's Article 9. And Article 9 says that all of the rights privileges and possessions of the native people will be restored to them as it was before the war on both sides. Very important uh, declaration, a treaty. 
Of course, it begs the question, what were our rights, our privileges, and our possessions? So part of the discussion about this whole legacy of the war is, what is the peace going to mean? As we know, the French were fighting the uh, British during the war, and the French helped to uh, help the Americans. And we also had an old treaty with the French. This is a little snuff box that was made with a symbol by the French. But in their view, it was the Americans won the war. So we see the Americans dictating the terms of the Treaty of Ghent. We see the British signing it. We see Britannia even kind of sitting there saying, oh, yeah, I lost another one. And we see the spirit of uh, victory uh, all flying over to the Americans. But who's in the middle? This nearly naked native person. That becomes a, like a standard uh, symbol. At the same time, that even that native person is saying, sign here. So with the treaty and its uh, terms, and with the fact that we only had maybe two defeats on the battlefield, our warriors from Grand River really felt pretty victorious. We didn't lose the war, despite what some historians say, but we maybe didn't win everything we had hoped to. 1815, this uh, man here, his name is Colonel William Klaus. He was the head of the Indian Department. He arrived at a place called Burlington Heights. You're familiar with that, where that is, uh, near the uh, Dundurn Castle. And he carried this wampum belt we see in the picture. That's, that's what this replica is up here. This belt came from the crown to thank not only the six nations, but all of the native uh, nations who participated uh, in the war to declare that the war was over. He read the terms of uh, the treaty, particularly Article 9. And then he said, the crown pledges that it will never interfere with your government or your culture. Well, that pledge lasted about eight and a half minutes, but uh, at least uh, it was made in 1815. And then they asked us to carry this belt around to all of the other native communities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. An important part of our relationship with one another is uh, these words of condolence I talked about. Whenever there was a battle, whenever we met each other to make a treaty, we would always perform this ceremony. And with these little strings of wampum, the first thing we would do is to say, we don't know what kind of grief you suffered on the way here. Maybe you've lost somebody. Somebody got hurt in battle or killed in battle. And so what we do is we take, we're gonna take this soft cloth and we're gonna wipe those tears from you so you can see how beautiful the world is. And we're gonna take a soft feather. We're gonna cleanse all of the dust that settles in your ear so you can hear the comforting words of uh, your allies. And with the third one, we're gonna give you this cool drink of water. It's like a form of medicine. It's gonna clear your throat and so you'll be able to be healthy. So we're uplifting then the people's uh, mind, their spirit, and their body. But this was a ceremony that we had to do because you can't come to terms, you can't make peace if, you're in, if you have the burden of grief or agony and your mind's tormented. So we're trying to make everybody's mind well. So we did this to our allies and then we applied the same thing after the war. We helped it. The British built a council house uh, called the Indian Council House near Fort George. They built it prior to the War of 1812. There were many big treaty meetings held down there. At one time, there were 3,000 natives gathered there. And the reason why so many gathered, whoever calls the meeting has to feed everybody. And usually these treaty councils lasted anywhere from four to eight weeks. So it's like free eats for eight weeks. Who wouldn't go to the meeting? So anyway, they're down there at this council house trying to solidify their relationship. As we would say, polish the covenant chain, trying to make amends for anything that might have gone wrong. Uh, maybe somebody took some land they're not supposed to. Uh, provide uh, food and ammunition for the people. So the covenant chain was a very real political device to solve our problems between our people. And it was uh, displayed down there at the council house, which unfortunately got burned to the ground during the War of 1812. I want to talk a little bit though about the stereotypes because this is one of the legacies of the battle. There was a fear of warriors on both sides of the British. Uh, some people were totally opposed to bringing in uh, uh, native warriors. They saw us as uh, bloodthirsty savages, uncontrollable. And the same thing with the Americans. I thought it kind of ironic that this painting was done after the Battle of Chippewa. And in it, we see this uh, British soldier laying there, wounded. On top of him was the native who tried to kill him. I got killed. And then supposedly this native woman comes along and breastfeeds this guy back to health. That's got to be some pretty powerful mother's milk. But uh, anyway, the whole, uh, let's just say the, the things that are going on and encoded in the painting about relationships, about what's going on, and as, of course, uh, the whole thing is a fanciful tale, but uh, other stereotypes are a lot more overtly uh, negative.